Hi, and thank you for stopping by our YouTube channel. To follow along with the sermon, download the My Sermon Notes app in the link below. For more sermons like this, go to citygatechurch.us. Enjoy, and God bless you. How's everybody doing tonight? Amen. I have uh, been working on something that my dad and I have been talking about, and he shared this Hebrew word with me last week. And uh, I haven't even talked to Becky about what happened to me last night. But I woke up in my sleep. I woke myself saying the name of this sermon tonight. And I just want to share it with you. The name of this sermon tonight is called He Named It. This is a Hebrew word. And I'm going to share with you what it means, but I want us to pay very close attention to this word because this is not for the faint of heart. It's not simple. It's not easy. This is very serious what we're going to talk about. And I want to share, if I can, this video with you right now. There was one Hebrew word that I would like to teach everyone that I come in contact with. It would be the word hineni. Hineni is a Hebrew word. It's actually two words, hine and ni, behold me. That word is translated into our English Bibles as here am I. Hineni is an ultimate word. It's not a word for uh, the weak. <laughs> it's not a word for the feeble. It's a word that depicts a son and a daughter of God. The prophets said Hineni. The sons of God said Hineni. Think about this, in, uh, in the book of Genesis, the first time Hineni is actually mentioned, God was calling to Abraham after Abraham received the promise, finally. He finally had the son in his old age, the son of promise, and God calls to Abraham and says, Abraham, and Abraham raises his, his hands and says, here am I, Hineni. And then God says, put that son on the altar. Here's what Hineni is. Hineni is a word for sons and daughters who are willing to say, God, here I am to do whatever it is that you call me to do, whatever the cost or whatever the consequence. I know I have some children. My kids love to volunteer for things that they know they're going to enjoy. But if I say, kids, come on, I have something for you to volunteer for, they're always going to say, Dad, what is it? But a son and a daughter of God will volunteer to God without knowing what's coming next because they trust that whatever it is that God says is going to be the ultimate thing that God wants. For me and for my life, when God revealed to me, you are a Jew, you are called to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, my only response was, Lord, here am I. Use me, send me, whatever it costs, whatever it means. I want to be a son and daughter of God. And I just want to encourage anybody that's going to be looking at these videos to be willing to say, God, here I am, like Isaiah did, like, like Ananias did, like Samuel did, like Abraham did, like Moses did, crying out to God. And the amazing thing is that when we say Hineni to God, according to the book of Isaiah, God says Hineni to us. In other words, God says, here I am, son. Ask me whatever you will, and I will provide for you. That sums up this word. Tonight, I want to explain this to you in a little more detail. There is no single word in English that means hineni. It's a Hebrew shorthand for here I stand, alert, ready, prepared to accept what you ask of me. Now, I believe we have someone in the room that is very well versed in this language, and I believe we're correct in our position. Samuel knows a little bit about the Hebrew language. Being born and raised in Nazareth, I believe he gets a little bit of it. But I want you guys to understand tonight, we're going to be looking at some people in the scripture who said these word, this word, hineni. The first person in the Bible to respond to God with hineni was Abraham. Now, in the video you saw a reference that was made to this that Abraham was asked. Now I want to ask you guys this question. How many of you want to volunteer to do something to help somebody? Yeah, you see now the reason there's no hands is because there's no information. If I gave you the information saying I need some volunteers to help do this or that or the other, then more hands go up because we all 
want to know what we're getting ourselves into, don't we? But I'm telling you now, with God, if you say this word, he named it. It is up to him to give you the order, and it is up to you to follow it to the letter. The scripture goes on and it says in Genesis 22 and 1, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Or he named me. Y'all say that with me. It's he, nay, me. Say it. He named me. Y'all just said, here I am. So look out. Y'all just got set up. That's pretty good, wasn't it, Chris? I want you guys to get a feel for this, to understand the purpose and the reason. Because Abraham's call was to obedience. The Bible says that Abraham was the father of the faithful. You see, when God calls you to something, he may or may not tell you what it is at that moment. But he's calling you to do something. I know that there are people that have stood up in the last several weeks in the past that have raised their hand and said, I've got a ministry. I want to start something. I want to do something. And I'm just amazed at how successful everything has been being. I can't wait for the day that every person in this room has a ministry of sorts that they feel God leading them to do something and they do that because they feel God is leading them. Last night as I, as I laid in bed, it was early this morning and I woke up with that word coming out of my mouth. He named me. And it scared me. Why do you think it would scare me? Well, this story right here, for one, Abraham, he said, I want you to do something. He didn't tell him that he wanted to lay Isaac at this point. He did not tell him that he was going to ask him to lay Isaac on the altar. He just said, I need you to do something, Abraham. And Abraham's answer and his response was, he named And then he said, take your son, your only son, and lay him on an altar. And I want to tell you guys something so that you understand this. This is a dedicated position. This is, I will hold nothing back from you, God. And you heard the author of the video as he was speaking. He said, in Isaiah it's spoken, we're going to get there. But Isaiah spoke and it says that God saying, I will do the same for you. I will not hold anything back from you. You don't hold back from me. I won't hold back from you. Isn't that a wonderful position to know that we can trust God like that? Yesterday morning, <laughs> Stephanie started texting me and I didn't get to bed until I think it was three o'clock before I ever went to sleep. Becky came in and said, something wrong, something is wrong. Stephanie is texting me. And so I rolled over and I, I, she had to wake me up because I was obviously in a coma. This was at 6 a.m. I looked over at my phone and I realized that I had my ringer turned down. It wasn't off, but it was down very low and I didn't hear it. And so I started responding back to Stephanie. And I was able to get to the hospital yesterday and be there at the birth of this child. But she told me, she said, I don't expect you to come. We know that you've got things to do. But I can tell you at this point in time, when I got that call, I did not hesitate to get myself ready and to go and do the national traffic thing and to get there and be with them at the birth of his child. Nothing was going to stop me. I was going to be there. What I want you to understand, if I was willing to do this, how much more so is God willing to show up when we call his name? Amen. How much more so is God willing to help us in our time of need, no matter what it is? But we have to be willing equally as willing to sacrifice the same way that God is willing to sacrifice. He said, I will do anything for you, but are you willing to do anything for him? Now, let me ask you guys this question. If there are people in your life, have you ever had somebody in your life, and I know you, you guys have got this amazing life and you don't have those kind of people in your world. 
that never call you for anything unless they want something. Nobody has that, right? I mean, nobody's got that kind of person in your life. How do you think God feels if we're that way with him? If we never want to have conversations, if we never want to talk to him, if we never want to spend time with him, if we never want to do anything to help him or to help his people or to help his church or to further a cause that he has laid upon your heart, how willing will he be to help us? The truth of the matter is he is always willing. He's always saying to us, he named it. Here I am. But he gets to say it with the big eye, right? Isn't this a wonderful thought? The second person in the Bible to respond to God with Hineni was Israel. We knew him early in the Bible as Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel has 12 sons that becomes a nation, thus the nation of Israel. So Hineni was the second person he was revealed to was Israel or Jacob. In Genesis 46, so Israel took his journey with all that he had and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to God of his father. This is verses one and two of 46. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. He named it. Now we know that it was in this dream that he's laying, he put his head upon a rock and he has a dream and we refer to it as Jacob's ladder because a ladder extended from heaven to earth and, and the Bible says that in the dream that Jacob saw angels going up and down, up and down, up and down on this ladder. The important thing is what was Jacob called to do? What was Israel called to do? The first one was called to obedience. Abraham was called to obedience. But then Jacob or Israel was called to reconciliation. He was called to reconcile a relationship between him and his brother Esau. Now, why is this important? Because reconciliation is one of the things that keep God's people from being in God's will. Reconciliation is the one thing we never want to do. We don't want to reconcile. We want somebody to come and apologize to us, but we don't want to reconcile. We don't want to make it right. We don't want, we want to stand there. Mm. This is a true statement. I'm the same way. I have offended people and I have been offended. And I expect them to respond the way I respond. If I offend somebody, I want to do my very best to make it right. Whether I did it intentionally or unintentionally is irrelevant, right? If you do it, you do it. And if it's been done to you, it's been done to you, yes or no? So why is it that we can't reconcile a situation? Because we don't get what we think we ought to get because we feel we deserve something. The truth of the matter is you deserve nothing. The truth of the matter is the nothing that you deserve has a name and it's called hell. And we all deserve that. But by the mercy and grace of God, by the blood that's applied to us in our lives, what do we wind up with? Reconciliation to God because God put himself out there through his son Jesus, offered the sacrifice that he would not allow Abraham to make. And gave us a free walk into heaven that we paid nothing for. All he asks us to do is to answer when he calls one simple word. He named it. Are you getting this tonight? Is this making sense to you tonight? Watch this. The third person in the Bible to respond to God with he named it was Moses. Now, most people know the story of Moses. Moses was born a Hebrew. Pharaoh decided to kill all the children. We see that again come when Christ comes on the scene. And his mother saw him and saw that he was a proper child. And he would not, she rather, would not allow him to be killed. So she made a little basket 
of bulrushes, put him in the Nile, and set him adrift. There's one specific animal in the Nile that is a very carnivorous beast. It's a crocodile. Nile crocodiles are known for their aggression. But not one of those bothered this child. As this child floated down to where Pharaoh's daughter was, Pharaoh's daughter saw this child, saw that he was a proper child, took that child as her own, found because of the sister of Moses, Miriam, finds a wet nurse, which happens to be Moses' mother. And we know the rest of the story. But Moses grows up and he, and he gets into trouble because he takes the life of someone. The Bible says in Exodus 3, 4, this is the story of the burning bush. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside, pay attention to that phrase, to look. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. He named him. Now I'm telling you that God puts things sometimes directly in our path, but he also puts them to the side. And he tries to get our attention with things. How many times are we oblivious to what God is wanting us to do? It's so easy. I was talking with my aunt earlier this week, and I love to talk to her because I've lost so many of my family members, and I try to make it a point to contact them and call them. And I called my aunt, and she said, you know what? I thought the other day, it's been a while since you called me. And I said, Aunt Karen, you know that that phone works both ways, right? It will call out. I said, maybe that was the Lord putting that on your heart to call me, but I know what you said. You said, get behind me, devil. Y'all will get it in a minute. Because sometimes when God wants us to do things, we don't think that it's God. We think it's the devil, or we want to make us feel like, make ourselves feel like it's us. When in fact, it actually is God. God's moving on us to do something. If somebody comes to your mind to call how much do you like getting a phone call from somebody that you love, that you care for? If somebody puts it on your heart to do, do it. James Mann is in this room right now. And every once in a while, I get a text from James. And it's a simple text. And he'll say something along the lines, I'm thinking of you, buddy. I love you. I hope you have a great day. And I always try to text him back immediately if I can. But that is a day changer for me because I know that James took time out of his day to send me a text message. You see, that's what I'm talking about, guys. When God puts something on your heart to do, do it. Just simply say, he named me. Here I am. I'm willing to do, God. And he starts us off with the little things. And simply look at a bush on fire, Moses. Walk over there and see what's going on with it. Check it out because I've got something I need to say to you. I need your attention. Sometimes in the distractions is what God puts out there to get our attention. Amen? Moses' call was to leadership. Moses was trained in the house of Pharaoh. He learned all about the world. He learned about government. He learned how to rule he was taught by the best teachers were available of the time. So he understood military because he had to be a warrior because kings were warriors at that time. So he had to learn battle. He had to learn strategy. He had to learn how to rule and how to lead. And God put him in that house so he could do that because he knew if he stayed where he was, all he would learn how to do was to be a slave. Are you paying attention to me? So sometimes it looks like your circumstances are horrible. Sometimes it looks like your circumstances have got you in a really bad place. But what if God is preparing you for something greater? I spoke with someone this week and they were telling me about 
how that they just can't stand for people to whine and complain. Anybody relate to that at all? Just can't stand to hear it. But if anybody had a right to whine and complain, this person did. From early, early childhood issues, problems, some that you would be mind boggled by. Damage, hurt, pain, suffering, all the way through adulthood, still suffering different things. But I don't want to hear anybody complain because I'm not complaining. That's the right attitude, isn't it? Everybody in this room has something that they can complain about. Yes or no? Everybody has something they can complain about. I got this little saying, people ask me, how are you doing? I tell them, you don't want me to ask you and you don't want me to tell you. Why? Because the truth of the matter is, we're in the South and we do it as a courtesy. How are you doing? How's your mom and them? For those of, of the deep South persuasion. <laughs> we ask that question. How are you doing? And when somebody goes to get honest with us and tell us how they're really doing, we withdraw. Uh, not really what I was wanting to know. I just wanted you to say fine so I could walk on by. That's what Samuel taught me one time was, you know, if you're not, if you ask somebody how they're, doing, how they're doing today, don't ask unless you expect to hear the answer and sit there and talk to that person. But in the South, we don't just do that, do we? In the South, we, we ask and we expect to hear nothing back other than, I'm good, thanks. Yeah. When we're called to leadership, when we're called to do something, we should never balk at what God is trying to get us to do and where God is trying to lead us. And let me help you with something so that you understand this. Leadership is not necessarily always the church. Leadership is not always a position or a title. Leadership is you being a Christian wherever you are in the people's presence that you're in. That's leadership because they see you and they follow you whether you realize it or not. I spoke with someone earlier this week, actually two people in the same day, because I, I wondered about the effectiveness of our videos. You know, we, we film these every week and we put them out online when I don't fail to push the button to say start or I don't go super speed on the thing, you know, because I got glasses and I should wear them and I try to act like I don't need them and I really do. But I found this person that contacted me and said, I want you to know something. We started a group in our church, in our school. Let me try this again. We're in a church in a school, all right? At work, we started a group. And it is a very liberal place. And they don't like it when we talk about God. We can talk about anything else we want to talk about and nobody will say anything. But if you ever talk about God, it's a problem. But we have started among ourselves a group. And we watch some of these great pastors. And he named several of them. And I agree with them. They have a great ministry. And I love to listen to them. And he said, but how may I turn them on to you and your videos? And we watched your series on Revelation. I said, it took you a while. And one of the guys said, there are no pastors there out there that are out there today that are willing to discuss the subject of revelation. But this man went through the whole thing and he answered questions. He did the best he could with all the knowledge he had. Let's keep watching it. I'm telling you, this ministry that we have of putting videos out online with our website, people are watching them. I spoke with someone the same day that said, I asked him, I said, what do you think about the new website? I absolutely love it, and I love the videos. I said, well, when's the last time you watched one? Because I'm thinking, you know, that's been a minute. It was week before last I watched a video and what you talked about, and it really helped me, and, make, and I'm like, I was blown away. I'm telling you this so that you understand. Leadership, you lead from wherever your position is, and it doesn't matter what the position is, whether at school, 
whether at work, whether at home, in public, you lead from the position you're in. Dad always told me, he said, son, bloom where you're planted. That's a powerful statement. God is trying to get us to bloom where we are. People need what we have. And that is simply Jesus. Amen. Amen. The fourth person in the Bible to respond to God with Hineni was Samuel. Both the one in the room and the one in the Bible. <laughs> Hineni. Samuel. Listen to this. 1 Samuel 3, 4. That the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here I am. He named him. Now you need to understand something. Samuel from birth was given to God. Actually prior to birth. His mother promised that if God would give, him a ch give her a child, that she would give him back to God. And when this child was weaned, when Samuel was weaned, I want you to think about that word weaned. No longer dependent upon his mother. And I will say potty trained. The mother took the child and gave him to the high priest, which was Eli. How many are ready to sign up for that? That's what I thought. I know some dads are like, man, can, can they go now? Do they have to be babies? Can we do it now? <laughs> So you think about the dedication that this mother had, that she gave a child. Now, I want you to listen to this, because it was while Samuel slept that the voice of the Lord came to him and said, Samuel, Samuel. And he got up and he ran to Eli. And if you read this in the scripture, every time he responded to Eli, he responded with, he named him. Here I am ready to serve. What do you need? I'm good to go. Whatever it is, I'm prepared. Let's go. What do you need me to do? Do you see that position? As a servant, he went to Eli. And the third time, Eli said, the next time you hear this, say to the Lord, speak, your servant hears. So three times he responded. He named it. On the fourth response, he responded with what Eli gave him and said, speak, your servant hears, he's already reported a duty three times. And then God said to him, and he spoke to him some very serious things. Now I want you to listen to this, because the next morning, Eli said to Samuel, what did the Lord say to you? And if you don't tell me that whatever you hold back from me that God does to you, that's what Eli said to him. So I want to know the truth and I want to know it all. So what was Eli's call? Or Samuel's call rather? Samuel's call was to speak truth. Now I want to tell you something. The Bible records that every word that came out of the mouth of Samuel, not one word hit the ground. Not one word that came out of his mouth hit the ground. Now I know there's some people in the room that like the truth hammer. That's a good thing. I'm just telling the truth. Well, there's an attitude that goes with that that doesn't fall in line with this kind of truth. I'm just saying. Maybe it does, but more than likely it doesn't. But I want you to think about this. He was given to God as a child. My dad said this to me. We were talking about this and discussing about Samuel. He said, how would you like, son, for every word that you've ever spoken to have never hit the ground. I said, Daddy, I'd have to go back three lifetimes to fix all that. Anybody else with me on that one? I'm just putting that out there. How much of, how much of what we say doesn't do anything to help the body of Christ or help our witness? Just putting that out there. How many times do we say things that we shouldn't say? We're still human, right? How many times do we carry things that we shouldn't carry? How many times do we attack when we should be silent? The Bible tells us to be slow to speak and slow to anger, slow to wrath. But yet we feel justified in our positions because we feel like we're speaking what? The truth. 
We need to slow down. I wrote a definition for wisdom. I've shared it with you many times, but I'm going to share it again. Wisdom is not the speed in which one answers the question. But in the time one takes to ponder the question before answering. You see, we think that wisdom is being able to answer the question quick. We always engage our mouth before we engage our brain. Therefore, we're still human. But when we slow ourselves down enough to be able to speak the truth in love, Samuel then repeats to Eli verbatim what God told him, what was going to happen, how it was going to work. And Samuel, or Eli blessed Samuel and he blessed God. You know what the truth was? That both of Eli's sons were practicing wickedness in the temple. They were doing wrong. And in a battle, both sons were killed. A messenger, a person, fled the battle, came back, told Eli what happened. The Bible says that Eli was a very big man. He was fat. He had gotten fat in the temple eating the things that he shouldn't eat, touching the things he shouldn't touch, taking things he shouldn't take. And he was in his 90s. And when the message came, it is said that he fell back off of his chair, fell on his head and neck, and his neck was broken, and he died the same way God revealed to him as Samuel spoke to him. The fifth person in the Bible to respond to God with Hineni was Isaiah. Isaiah. The Bible says, Isaiah 6, 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. He named him. Right before this, the Bible says that the seraphim came and took a tongue and took fire from the altar and he touched it to Isaiah's mouth, to his lips. And God says then after that, who are we going to send? And Isaiah says, send me. He named me. Here I am, willing to do it all. Whatever you need, I'm your guy. Isaiah's call was to restoration. Isaiah gave a word that was to restore Israel. One of my favorite verses of Isaiah is... We will mount up with wings as eagles. We will walk and shall not faint. We will run and not grow weary. I think I got that backwards. I know I got it backwards. But that's the gist. You can look it up. But it's one of my favorite things because Isaiah's message was to restore Israel. God wanted Israel restored. He wanted restoration. And he told him as he responded to God, he named him. What has God called you to do? That's my question to you tonight. What has God called you to do? You know he's called you to do something. You're running from it. You're, you're not wanting to do it. You don't want to hear it. You don't want to listen. It's not time. I don't want to do this. That's not me. I'm not that person. That's somebody else that needs to do that. If God called your name, he expects you to do it. Amen. Amen. His expectation of you is if he's laying something on your heart, if you have something that keeps running around in your head, man, I need to do this. I need to say this. I need to go here. Whatever it is, it needs to be done. We've had several ministries start recently, but tonight we're celebrating warm hands, warm hearts. Brandy brought us something that God laid on her heart. I want to help the homeless in Gallatin. All these other people have got all this help, but I want to help the people that are here. And she asked for hats and gloves, clothing items for warmth, blankets, Bibles, whatever we could bring to help. And that table is covered with things tonight to help people that we don't know. But isn't that the point? Do we have to know the person that we help? One person. Let me show you something. This young lady. Listen to God. 
And we all are going to be blessed because we all got involved. And that's a wonderful thing. But the one that's going to be blessed the most is the recipient. They're not going to have that cold hit them. They're going to be able to have a word in their hand to learn more, to believe more, to trust more. So many stories have been told about people in military who've carried Bibles in their pockets. Their bullets have stopped, have been stopped by that word. I want to tell you, no matter what the devil fires at you tonight, no matter what he's doing to you, you need to understand that God has already said to you, he named me. Here I am. I am. Mm, I am your shield. I am your buckler. I am your defense. I am your protector. I am your financial security. I am your health. I am your strength. I am your guide. I am your friend. He named me. Here I am. What has God called you to do? Will you say, he named me? Here I stand, alert, ready, prepared to accept what you've asked of me. Are you there? Are you ready? Maybe you're not. And that's okay. Because I promise you, I promise you, these are all the things that we say. Next week, tomorrow, another day, someday, in the future, later, next year. I have a little boat, nothing fancy. And I've been saying, I wanna take that boat and I wanna go fishing. Another year has passed. And another year, and another year, and another year. I just don't have time. Isn't that where we all are? Aren't we all busy? I was talking with a friend the other day. Both of us work together in Nissan. And he said, man, he said, I don't have time to do nothing. And I told him, I said, Bobby, isn't it crazy that we worked between 10 and 14 hours a day. And we had time to come home and go to dinner with our families and cut grass and take care of livestock and do all our hobbies and go places and do stuff. And since we've got out of there, we don't have time for anything. But you know what? It's not unique to he and I. It's with every person in this room. We don't have time for anything. The reason is, is that we're busy. We spend so much time in our busy state. Creed, if you and April will walk to the back of the room. I just want you guys to know that our prayer team is there tonight. Not only can they pray with you, but they want to pray with you. If you've got a need, if you've got something you want to pray about, they're there. They will pray with you and they will pray for you. And you need to know that they're there and they're available. I'm telling you right now so that you understand this and you don't miss what I'm saying. He named me was not an accident. Not at all. It's not an accident that we're having this conversation. I was awakened in the middle of my sleep early this morning, speaking this word. I walked around in the hall and I said, God, forgive me for not allowing myself to be available to what all you want to do in and through me. I want you to know that God is here right now. If you've got something you just want to get off your chest, Go pray. If you want to rededicate your life, go pray. If you want to give your life to Christ, go pray. Nobody's going to judge you. You guys know everybody in this church. You know how we are. We don't play the judge game in here. 
We don't do that. We accept every person that walks in the door unconditionally, no matter what. Don't bring that judgment mess in here because that's when you get a one-on-one -on -one with me. I want you to know that God is here for you right now. Bow your hands. Father, I thank you so much for the day. For your goodness, for your mercy, for your kindness, and for your love. Father, as this song plays, I surrender all. Lord, allow us to say, He named me. Here I am. Let us be willing to lay ourselves, our agendas, our issues, our problems at your feet and follow you and follow your voice. Follow your call. Lord, I bless those that are here that are listening tonight. Those that are watching on video. Lord, wherever they are, hear them. Heal them. Mend them. Call them to you. Allow us to follow you tonight, Lord. I give you the glory and the honor and the praise. And I do it all in your name, Jesus. God bless you guys.